Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. And today I am talking Lysianthus with Dave Dowling. And I have named this episode Cool Start to a Hot Finish Lysianthus. And that is a phrase that Dave has coined. And I just found it to be so very, very appropriate. So friends, if we've never met before, welcome aboard. Um, I am a part of the gardenersworkshop.com flower farmer. Um, We have an online garden shop and a learning center. And a big part of that learning center is helping farmers find their way in building or starting or scaling up their cut flower growing operations. And um, you will get a taste today of Dave Dowling's teaching style. Y'all, the information just pours out of this guy. I've been friends with Dave for almost 20 years, and I learn something every single time that I talk to him. And he is just totally submerged in all of this and just, just oozes it. And it is just such a benefit for all of us that are a part of his world. And if you want to learn more about his online course, which is called Bulbs, Perennials, Woodies, and More. Um, it is a six, it's one of our six week schools. You can sign up to get on his wait list over at the gardenersworkshop.com. Registration only happens once a year in June. And if you don't want to miss it, sign up and get on the list. Um, and then school actually starts in July, and people are thinking, oh my gosh, that's like farming season. Well, friends, that is also when you should be preparing and ordering all these things he's teaching you about, bulbs, perennials, woodies, um, and more. And so we moved this course to that date at the request of his past students. That was one of the number one suggestions that we got, how helpful it would be to have direct access to Dave through the weekly Q&As when they're actually doing it. Um, So that's why that is. And, you know, the big gift of online courses is you have lifetime access, so you can speed watch them to participate in the Q&As, but you can always go back and watch them over and over and over again. And that's what we find people do. As they need that bit of information, they go back and find it. So friends, today I am talking to Dave about Lizzie Anthus, and let's just step in and take a listen to how my conversation went with him. Hi, Dave. Thanks for joining me here today. Hello again. How are you doing? I am very good, and I just so appreciate you kind of sharing your wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm excited to talk about Lizzie Anthus today, which is become just such a big crop for so many people. Um, I think now that more and more people are realizing that they can really grow it, even people in the field, the field is more challenging as far as watching for weather, but we can all grow it. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm glad for you to, to share some information here. So, so why is Lysianth is such a great crop, do you think? Well, it's a great flower because it has a really long vase life. Um, sometimes the last two weeks with no water change, you know, the buds will still continue to open. It's a tough crop for the farmer. In other words, tough as in sturdy. Um, I have before seen where people pick them and left them out in the field by accident. And the next day they still look good. Lisa's raising her hand. She's done that. Um, they make are great for boutonnieres and corsages because the flower does not wilt. You can take that flower, you know, wrap it up in a boutonniere and it's good for the whole wedding. It's not going to go bad. Um, it's not going to get crushed when you hug grandma because it just pops right back. It's almost like it's magic. You know, it just, it's hard to damage a Lysianthus flower unless you really squeeze it and step on it. Maybe, um, you know, it's, it's not going to go bad in a bucket or on a boutonniere or corsage or in a bridal bouquet. Um, it's a really tough flower, but with a tough flower comes, it's tough to grow. Um, it's difficult to get them started. They're one of the slowest growing seedlings out there. Um, 10 to 12 weeks just to get something that has four leaves big enough to pick up with your two fingers. So it's, it's a challenge to grow it. There are some people who do it great on their own, but it's one of the ones I always recommend buy plugs. You'll yeah. just be so much happier when you get a plug tray and have 210 exactly matching plants. They're all an inch tall and you try to grow hundred plants and you end up with 30 that are all different. You'll see the value of buying the plugs. 
the plugs are more expensive than most flowers. They're 30 to 50 cents each, depending on the size of the plug and the variety, but it's worth it because um, it's also a high dollar flower and you got to sell it. Um, you know, they're not selling for 75 cents a stem. You're getting two and three dollars a stem for them. Even selling yeah. to a florist is paying almost two dollars a stem, $20 a bunch or more. I mean, if there is any flower that just sweeps people off of their feet, it's Lysianthus for yeah. sure. I mean, yep. straight bunches as a bouquet or whatever you have. So let's clear up um, right out of the gate. I know that there's gr- there's numbers often listed after mm-hmm. the Lysianthus. Explain right. to us what the numbers mean and how that would apply. Yeah, the Lysianthus have numbers similar to uh, Snapdragons, one, two, three, four. One of the breeders has even come up with a number five. They have the numbers one, two, three, four, but it's not the same as the snapdragon. It's not necessarily, you know, one for winter and four for summer. It's basically how fast they grow and bloom after you plant them out. But if you're growing them in lower light, winter time, not um, cold, uh, like South Florida, South Texas, you can do it in the winter or in a heated greenhouse in the winter, um, you normally should add some extra lighting in the winter, but you would grow a group one in the winter. If you're trying to get into bloom in the winter, December, January, and February. Other than that, you're most likely to just plant them all in the field. If you're warmer zone, you can fall plant them as a cool flower or just plant them out in very early spring. I like to say four to six weeks before your last frost, whether it's in a tunnel or the field, they like a cool start and a hot finish is the easiest way to describe it. Um, They benefit if you use plastic, use white plastic, not black. Don't recommend black fabric because it heats the soil up too much in the spring when they like a cool start. So they just don't grow the good root system that they should get Um, because the soil is too warm for them. All right. So, um, so group one is for people that are trying to get them to bloom in the winter. That would be somebody in the deep South zone nine and 10 or growing in a heated greenhouse with supplemental light. Right. Right. Yep. And then what about group? So two, three, four, we won't even talk about four. Right, two, three, and four, you can plant this all at the same time in the either overwintered if you're in a warmer zone, if you want to do the cool flowers, or very early spring. But you can plant all group two, three, and four all, say, April 1st, if your last frost date is May 1st. Plant them April 1st, but then the group two is going to bloom a little before group three, which is a little bit before group four. But it's not like it's a two-month difference. You're talking a few weeks difference. So it spreads out your harvest a little bit. Now, the group twos will usually be a little bit smaller and shorter, usually, because they are going to bloom a little sooner so they don't have that extra week or two to grow in more height. That, that makes sense. sense. Yes. Um, but then the other thing is sometimes when you're picking your Lysianthus, you don't always have to worry so much about the group is you want to get the right flower that you're looking at, the, the right color or the right flower form. Because years ago, there was just single Lysianthus and they came with doubles and then they got doubles with ruffles and doubles with triple ruffles and quadruple flowers. So just so many different ones to, to grow now. And also some really unique colors like the, the Roseanne, um, brown color ones that they're the only ones that have brown. Um, you know, it's that tan color, like uh, tea color flower. Right. Um, so if you want that color, you've got to grow Roseanne. So there's no option other than growing the Roseanne. So are we saying then, because I was going to say, you know, I've, I've grown different, you know, two, threes and fours. They're all planted mm-hmm. at the same time. And I mean, they might have a, a week difference bloom right. time. But not Very much. little difference. Not much, yeah, right? Not much. Okay. So we're just looking. It's calm. It's almost like early and late tulips, right? I mean, there's just right. really not that big a difference. Exactly. So to not even get caught up in the numbers on Lysianthus, totally different story with Snapdragons. Correct. Right. So yep. even it so if I planted group ones, which I have, they'll just bloom earlier and shorter, probably if they're Often out. Often the shorter, field. yes. Yep. Yes. So that may explain a pro. Yeah, that that just makes such good sense. So, um, all right. So we we typically plan them usually about six to eight weeks before last frost, um, and they are amazingly winter hardy. I mean, it's surprising yes. to me. I will tell you. So, the experiment I'm doing this year with Lysianthus is that you know, we do know that they're winter hardy. Um, you know, zone seven, eight, and nine. I've been told by other people that they're in higher zones, but I fear to claim those publicly, you know, much, 
But my question is, it's like, what is the benefit really of fall planting and suffering through winter weather out in the field, making sure that, you know, they don't die. So this year I've ordered, I have planted Lizzie in the fall, normal cool flower time. And I am also planting the same exact varieties again in very early spring. And we're going to compare is there really a difference in stem length? Is there really an abundance? Is there more? Are they more hardy? Um, so we're really interested to do that this year. But I will tell you that after our snow event last week, which meant all my covers were down, then we got down to 11 degrees was the coldest um, night. Um, my Lizzie is totally uncovered and it is all totally still there alive. I mm -hmm. can hardly believe it. Um, so when they're happy, give them good drainage, right? Good Excellent drainage, drainage, yes. And they're yeah. well established. Um, and we, I know that this probably isn't the norm either, but we plant 285 straight in the field um, and they come along pretty okay. Yeah, um, you can plant the smaller plugs directly in the field as long as you baby them in the field for a few weeks after planting. You don't want to plant them and walk away from them. Right. Because they can dry out on a sunny day and then they're dead. Sure. So, all right. So we've learned that the numbers really make no difference um, if with Lizzie Anthus. So let's talk about some of your favorite varieties or what um, I'll say what mine have been as a 100% field grower. Um, the first couple of years I grew, I grew Echo and Mariachis mm -hmm. and they could be short, you know, short. They were kind of, they were right on the edge of being useful. I mean, it was right. pretty torturous. Um, but I then learned about ABCs. And I mean, I can grow a 40 inch ABC out in the field. Right. It's absolutely amazing. Well, one thing is the echoes are group one. So they're going to grow yes. and bloom the soonest. So they're going to be a little bit shorter. Um, the mariachis, they're very from most of them are group two. There's a couple that are group three. Um, so that would make them a little bit taller. But then if you're going back, you said your ABCs, the ABC does come in ones, twos, threes. Um, and there's even a few ABC, no, just ABC two and three. So some of the ABC3 is going to bloom later, so they're going to be taller. And like in the ABC, there's the ABC1 white and ABC3 white. So you can plant the ABC3, and it's going to grow taller, bloom a little bit later, but be taller. Um, one other thing I want to point out real quick is Lysianthus often has problems with roots rotting. Yes. Um, so it is one plant that really does benefit if you use root shield before you plant them. And root shield is a naturally occurring beneficial bacteria bacteria, I think, um, organism. <laughs> I've, I can't say the name, it's Treka something. Um, but you basically just soak the plug trays or the, the water them one time before you plant them in that. And it, it just helps eliminate root rot and root problems. I would see that being super useful for fall planting with the yes. winter being wetter. Yep. Um, so that might be something that you may not consider necessarily if you don't have to for spring planting but for fall that would definitely yeah. be a benefit yeah or if you know you've had problems in the past exactly just in, it's in your soil or something that's not not good for the lysanthus um but as far as varieties like i mentioned before there's the roseanne which is the ones that come in the brown and the roseanne green is a very different green than some of the other ones it's much the flower is much more full and dense it's just different um then you would grow in the mariachi which is really nice Yes. Um, the, lots of different colors and medium to tall. Um, and then the ABCs are all good. And then there is a new uh, series that's come to the U.S. in the past couple of years. It's from Sumaka Seeds in Japan. And it's uh, like six or seven different one. One is summer. One is, I forget the other names. So it's like six or seven different series within that. And some are really, really roughly, really, really full, tall plants, all good varieties. Um, but, but that's an option for people to try. But then there's just, I always like the one, the Rosita, because the plants aren't quite as tall, but it really is branched a lot. So you have lots of flowers, the flowers are a little bit smaller, but they're really, really full. And people do look at it and think it's a rose because it's so full, it looks like an open uh, spray rose. You know, um, I grew Roseanne Green last year mm -hmm. and we were quite smitten with it. Um, yeah, it's just and I'll a different tell color. You it's a great color. And not only that, you know, being an outdoor field grower, we're always looking at rain damage, you know, because we try, always tried to have at least four 
blooms open on a stem, a stem right. before we cut it because that's the most value, right, for our customers. Well, the risk is what if it rains during that time that those flowers are opening? And so there were certain colors. I mean, as much as we loved purple and we wanted it, it was just a high risk for rain right. damage, right? Yep. That Roseanne green, it was like, you couldn't even ever tell it rained on it. I mean, it was really a nice bloom. And you know, another one that we really liked was double teeny. Have you, did you ever grow that little I I never grew that one, no. But it's another small flower, but really full. Right. Yes. Um, And it resisted the rain damage. It's the the way the petals are shaped. I think the water just naturally runs off instead Mm -hmm. of in the bloom. One one, One other thing to think about is that on your darker flowers, you can also have, have visible damage from thrips because if you get oh, yeah. thrips on them and they'll damage the dark flowers, it shows you can have thrips crawling all over your white flowers. and It never shows because what they do is they little scrape, scrape on the flower with the little teeth and put bruises on the flower. It shows on the dark flowers. It does not show on the light color flowers. And when you say that shows and that's the little white streaks, that little white streaks. Yep. Purple. Mm-hmm. yep. Yep. Um, yeah, those little rascals. Yeah, thrips can be nasty. Yeah. Um, one other thing we're talking about in harvesting, you said you like to have four flowers. Most Lysianthus has a central flower that's going to bloom first, and then yeah. a week later, the, the, the side buds open. A lot of people will sometimes go out and pinch out that middle one first, so that it encourages the four or five side blooms all open at once. So if you, if you leave it to bloom on its own, that first flower is going to go bad before the next four or five, because it's usually about five or six days between that first flower opening and then where the, the big mass of the branch flowers open. That is so true. And, you know, as we ramped up and got into higher production, we used to go out and disbud those little babies. Right. Because mm-hmm. when you're going to the farmer's market, they had about a four or five inch little stem on them. You, you can sell them. Those little, <laughs> I mean, we were selling those little Lizzie, I mean, teacup. I think that's what are juice them, glass. Right. bouquets. We were selling them for almost as much as our big bouquets and they yes. were gift buds. But then as business got crazy, you just, we just left them. Right. And then when we ultimately harvested, we just cut that one out because it right. was, you know, had gone South already. I think right, the biggest so, thing I was going to say, I think the biggest thing is don't, you want to resist the urge to pick it when that's just that first flower is blooming. Yes. Yes, for sure. And we'll talk about harvesting more in just a minute. But yeah, that is a great point, Dave. All right. So we have Echo, Mariachis, ABCs, Roseanne, Rosita, and Double Teeny. Did you grow any others that you really loved? That's the ones that I grew. Um, like I said, there's that whole new series of the Japanese ones from Somika, which yeah. there's Summer. And I don't have my book in front of me here that has all the other names on it. I mean, the biggest challenge that I face now as a smaller grower is, you know, you want to get different colors, but you don't want to have to plant 300 of each color. So then you start buying larger cell packs and that just makes it even more easy and successful. Um, So, all right. So we've got some variety and we talked about the spacing um, or not spacing, but the timing of when Mm -hmm. to fall or either very early spring. So what kind of spacing did you um, like to do on Lizzie's? I used to use the support netting again, because you don't want them to fall down, whether it's in a tunnel or field, you don't want them to fall over because then they get crooked stems and they're ruined. But I used to use, think of a checkerboard. I would put one plant in the red square and two plants in the black square. So I was putting six plants per square foot. Some of the seed companies and the Lysianthus breeders, they say to put as many as uh, 10 per square foot. So that'll be, you know, even more. I think that after, I don't know what got me to start making my Lizzie's tighter and tighter, but I'm feeling pretty sure it was after I talked to you several years ago. I mean, I like most novice people that are just starting to grow and, you know, you put four plants in a 30 inch bed, four rows. Yeah. And then you soon realize you're looking at more bed top when they're grown than you are anything else. Um, So we have evolved to now we grow, uh, we put eight rows in a 30 inch wide bed. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do is we use the netting and we put two plants on the outside, then one plant, then two plants. Um, Mm -hmm. And they do beautifully. And I mean, if there's anybody that neglects their crops, as far as not being really on top of doing everything, 
they still did great in spite of me. If you can just get them, don't you believe if you can just get them in the right spot with good drainage, get them well rooted in, meaning get them you have to in. keep them watered, get important. them established, then they bloom in the hottest, most blistering part of the season. Don't mind it. They're native to Texas. They love the heat. Yes. That doesn't bother them at all. Right. Um, so your spacing, tell me again what you. It was basically, if you take four squares of the netting, which is a square foot, two of the squares had two plants and two squares had one. Basically the same as what you did. Yes. You did two, one, two, one. The same right. idea. Um, all right. So what kind of feeding program? I mean, is just a general, the same as, just kind as of general. like the snaps? Yeah. Yeah. Like the, jet, like the snaps. They're not that picky. Again, they were a wildflower. You know, they grow with less optimal conditions, but, um, but food always makes a difference. So. So very true about that. Um, and so now let's talk about harvesting. So let's just jump back to what we talked about a minute ago. So that first central bloom is not the sign to cut the whole stem. Exactly. Wait, wait another yes. five days to a week. And if you are doing markets, you know, that might, and, the, and you, you're, you're going somewhere that might, because it's a lot of work. First off, it is not easy to have, those stems are so short. Right. You, I mean, it's almost easier to stuff a plastic bag on them with a wet paper towel and keep them wet, because we know Lizzie's are pretty hardy that way. Right. Yep. Um, that's the hardest part about trying. I mean, it was easy for our on-farm market because they were right here to keep them in the cooler. Didn't really worry if their stems were in or out of water for, you know, a little while. But that's really beneficial. So you disregard the first bloom. Yeah, don't harvest it. And so I always was a deep cutter. I mean, I literally oh. pretty much went all the way down, right? Yes. With Lysianthus, okay. they will rebranch out and rebloom a second flush, sometimes even a third flush if the, you have a long fall. Um, but what you want to do is make sure you pick it and leave a short stump, only having about four leaves at the base of the stem. Um, if you leave it with a six inch stem, you can get a whole bunch of little short side shoots that are no good. So yep. you cut it really low. And I used to not cut my Lysianthus. I snapped them off just like a uh, asparagus. I mean, they would lean over and snap them off. The only thing is they had to be really well rooted in the ground or you're not pulling them up. But yes. it makes it so easy to harvest that way. You can literally you bend over, snap it and put it in your arm and you just get an arm load. They go to the table, strip them and put them in the bucket. <clears throat> That's a great just snap point. them off. <clears throat> And you know what? I thought, Dave, that it was something wrong with my um, growing conditions that made mine so brittle that you could do that. But that's a Lysianthus trait. That's a Lysianthus. Yep. It'll snap off like that. Yep. Because that is mm. a super labor saver. Amazing labor saver. And also the point that you, you know, let's not miss the little tip you put at the beginning. The plants have to be well rooted in. Yes. Um, but you can just snap them. Huh. That is a great tip. All right. So my rule of thumb was, um, first off, I've always, when Lizzie's are coming into bloom, I like am obsessive about the weather forecast. I'm always looking to when the rain's coming to affect my harvest schedule because Lizzie Anthus, if you, you know, leave it out there and it's four blooms open, you can be sure you're going to lose at least three of them. <laughs> To the rain damage, right? So it's definitely very possible. And I don't want to imply that it's super difficult. You just have to be more conscious of the rain. Um, but my goal was to get at least four blooms open, particularly on mariachis, because they're loaded with buds. Right. And the other thing with Lysianthus, talking about picking according to the weather, they're not uh, ethylene sensitive. So you can pick them on Wednesday, leave them in the cooler till Saturday, and they're perfect. They're not going yeah. to have any problems sitting in the cooler that long. Um, so don't feel like you have to wait and pick those last. They can be one of your first things you pick every day or in the week. And, you know, that's one of the things that you learn, right? As you start growing and actually harvesting, you understand it's like, oh, this I can leave until the very end. Or you kind of create this whole scenario in your mm -hmm. mind, is which is what helps you to get everything done. All right. So. Four blooms sound like a good goal to be open for you. Yep. Is that kind of what four you open blooms? Mean? Four open blooms, unless it's such a full stem that's got you know ten buds, you might wait another day or two. But aim for the four buds, four open blooms. And it's time to pick it. And you know, ABCs aren't as low. You know, you have to pay the price for every 
gift. And the gift of the ABCs being so tall, they have less buds. So Mm -hmm. you may or may not get four full open buds on that. You have, I mean, I would say on a guesstimation that you want half of the blooms open on a stem. Would that be a good way to to look at it? Half of them. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing we were talking earlier about how full your beds are thinking about all pretty much every flower you grow, when you look at the bed and it's in full bloom or ready to be picked, you shouldn't be able to see the ground in that bed. Whether it's snapdragon, sunflowers, ageratum, lysianthus, if you can see the ground, whether it's plastic mulch or bare dirt, when they're full-size plants, you didn't plant them close enough together. You know, and not only that, Dave, I mean, I see pictures on social media and I think, how did that plant ever grow up? totally surrounded by black landscape fabric with that heat because they haven't planted them close together. I mean, it's insult to injury. Um, So, right. When they're mature, you should, they should be like smashing. I mean, just up against each other and think how much more you can get out of that same space or how much you can reduce your space and get the same volume that you're currently getting it out of there. So, all right. So another thing that came to mind, we were talking about the denseness. I mean, you want to talk about some special attention to netting on Lysianthus that's planted eight plants wide on a bed. Um, And then the year that this happened to me, I forget where we were. I think we were, we were some conference Um, We had a late April, 22 degrees, and it actually snapped back all my lysianthus. It pinched it. And we literally got two to three major stems on each lysianthus plant. I couldn't believe it. But you couldn't believe the weight of the canopy. Very heavy. All those (laughs) plants. Steve and I were out in the rain on a Sunday morning. The entire bed, we, I mean, I saw it. One of the stakes broke and the tire bed just laid down. I mean, it was like a domino effect. Yep. We were out there in the rain. Oh my gosh. On Sunday morning driving, we ended up putting a stake every two feet all the way down the side that gave right. way. Um, so you have to really support that support. And I have never used two, du- two layers of netting. Have you? I, I never used two layers of anything. I can't imagine. Just I can't raise imagine. it up if you need to, but talk about the netting it should always be so stretched end to end yes. not yes. just lay there it should be stretched you lean back and pull on it to stretch it and get it yes. over this end post taunt. and then very taunt very taunt <laughs> that's one of those yes. old words um and then every depending on how big and heavy the crop is going to be every five or six feet on both sides you need a stake it doesn't have to be a big heavy t-post it can be some other stake but enough to keep that whole bed from falling over in the center because if you have a 30-foot bed and only support it on the ends when those plants are three feet tall, it takes us a wind and rain combined and the whole center is going to fall over. It will. And, you know, a couple of things you just said. So we ended up, our policy is now that we put a stake every four feet on our lysianthus beds. Mm-hmm. Um, because when you have a rainy season, as happens, and the canopy is heavy, those stakes lose their footing. You have to reduce the pressure on all of them right. overall. Um, so why I asked you about the double netting is I I feel the same way that you do. I have never, including dahlias, I have never had a crop that I felt needed a second layer. If you have the netting where it's supposed to be and it's taut enough in all directions, end to end, and then from side to side, um, it, that netting is stronger than most stakes that the stake is the weak spot. I find right. the netting is not going to break netting. That netting is tough. Especially there are some people now using wire netting where they take the, the fence panels and bend yeah. it and it works great, but it, it's not going to bend. It's the post that goes it gives that, out, not the netting itself. And I think that's a place where people often underestimate what they need, which leads them to use less. And it's just a problem. All right. So we've talked about our favorite varieties. Um, you Did we say that we buy them as plugs because they're so slow to grow? Yeah. We mentioned earlier, um, that they are 10 to 12 weeks to get a plant big enough to be able to pick up those four little leaves with your fingers to transplant it. Um, if you're really good with plants and starting seeds and you're going to be home for three months, that means no trips, no visiting your family for the weekend. And I also recommend if you're starting the plugs yourself that you, one person is in charge of them 
don't leave them to your husband, your wife, or the, the babysitter or somebody else on the farm to take care of them because they're going to mess them up. It should be yeah. one person responsible for them. So it's so much easier to buy the plugs. You're going to get in a tray of 210 or 120 plants that all match perfect, ready to transplant. That is just so very, very true. So I hope that this has kind of cleared the air um, for people, kind of opened up the opportunity. And I, I want people to understand that buying plugs is not a cop out. Buying plugs is what professionals do. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yep. It's smarter and it's more economical in the long run. So Dave, thank you so much for um, clearing that up for us. And um, okay. I have one more it. quick one more quick thing to tell about Lysianthus sure. is that you can grow them for a second year if you're in a milder climate or in a tunnel in zone six or seven or warmer. You just want to see how the plants look in October. If the plants look healthy and have little uh, uh, little buds, little sprouts below the leaves, you can usually overwinter them and they come back and bloom a couple weeks earlier the second year, but they won't give you a second flush the second year. But it, to me, it was always worth it to let them overwinter. I had them in a tunnel. I would overwinter them and get that first harvest in mid to late June, then take them out and plant something else. But they have to look good in the fall before you do that. If it's a sickly yeah. looking plant that's not happy, don't try and save it. But if it's a good looking plant, it's usually a little rosetta leaves in October, right. November, go ahead and try and overwinter them if you don't need the space for something else. Right. Awesome. All right, friends. Well, we're going to call it a day with that. And thank you so much, Dave. It's always great to talk with you. So did that clear any fog for you? And what an interesting concept that the groups of Lysianthus do not mean this, the group numbers behind the names and catalogs have a totally different meaning than they do for Snapdragons. And we wonder why we're confused. Now I know why I was confused. So I hope that this helped you either give you the push you needed to include Lysianthus in your lineup or perhaps to take the plunge and order plugs this year, or to just ramp up what you're actually doing. Because Lysianthus, in our experience, um, you know, Dave grew it, I believe, in a house and in the field. I've only grown in the field. And I just can't tell you how profitable of a crop it was and how much in demand um, the crop was. And in fact, when I, um, on the, the episode that I talked to Jonathan Lease of Spring Forth about flower colors. And, you know, his special business model is actually they only harvest and sell in the high demand season of early spring and or to early summer. And one of the things he mentioned missing growing more than anything else was Lysianthus because they have shut their operation down for harvesting and selling when Lysianthus starts to bloom. And that really, really helped me to realize sometimes the choices you have to make to choose the business model that is best for you, the most profitable, that fits your family. And that's what Jonathan's all about. Um, Jonathan and Megan are the instructors of the no-till microscale flower farm. And if you're interested in a lifestyle change, not having flower farming fit your life, not you know, squeeze your life in around flower farming. They're the ones, not to mention it's great farming information. So friends, remember, please review and share this podcast with your friends. It helps me so much. The, the podcast apps will show our podcast to more browsers um, based on the number of reviews that we get. So we just appreciate all your help. And friends, until we meet again, ciao.